this. All right, we're going to look at Paradise Lost today, uh, books one and two. And I hope you've had a chance to look ahead uh, and, and read on with it. How did you find it as reading? It's not the easiest stuff, no. Um, it does help, if I was, as I said to you, if you read it aloud. But that's, uh, when I say it helps, it doesn't make it easy. It, it, his uh, prose style is quite uh, rich and uh, it's been criticized uh, historically uh, being a little bit too Latinate. Uh, I think the prose is excellent myself, or, um, the, but, um, uh, or the, the verse rather, uh, the poetry. But I do think it takes time to get used to it. Uh, what I will say is that Milton's uh, verse becomes a model for later writers as well. They start following the same sort of rhythms and cadences and so forth. Um, and believe it or not, it's in some ways um, more like speech than uh, later writers like Pope will see. He'll write in, in rhyme, in rhyming couplets and so forth, which nobody speaks in other than nursery rhymes and so forth, right? But um, <coughs> So I'm going to read the beginning, but I'm going to today at the very outset emphasize the way in which Paradise Lost is following the conventions of the epic. And I said that to you last time, that what Milton is, is doing here with his subject matter is not only writing about the fall of mankind, <coughs> but writing it in an epic form. And by doing that, he's explicitly asking us to compare his subject matter with the subject matter of previous epics. And epics uh, were used by <coughs> the greatest of writers uh, throughout Western uh, literature to deal with the highest subject matter and the best <coughs> poems were said to be written in, in epic. So Milton is doing this co self-consciously and with a purpose. <coughs> so I'm going to see if I can get through this. I apologize for my cough and hopefully it won't interrupt me like I did in the, the last class. Um, <laughs> but note that he says that, he, that the poem hastes into the midst of things. So, a, a, and I will say, note at the beginning, it has an argument at the outset in which he gives away the whole plot, which seems uh, by today's standard a very odd thing. He's giving you the Coles and Oates version before you even read it. Well, why even read it? It would never occur to Milton that you would not then read it having discovered what the subject matter was because it's the way in which it's told that it makes it so interesting and compelling. But he does give away the plot. And he does say, the first book proposes in brief, the whole subject. Man's disobedience and the loss thereupon of paradise touches the prime cause of the fall. Uh, and then it hastes into the midst of things. It begins, though, with these, the first, how many lines here? 26 lines, and you can see them, then there's a little gap there, with what we will call, and uh, has become an epic convention by this point, which is that it begins uh, with an invocation of the muse. But I'll, I'll read the lines from the poem, and then I'll, I'll make some comments, and I'll have a lot to say about these first 26 lines, because there's, there's a lot going on there. But if you recall, last semester, or if it's been a while since you did first year survey, or if you've never did it, done it rather, um, epics begin by invoking a muse. Now the muses are the goddesses of poetry. Uh, there are nine of them. They're, they're, they're daughters of Zeus. And muses were higher powers, if you will, that a poet appealed to to, to aid him in uh, the act of of whatever it was, because there's it's not just poetry, there's a muse of history, Cleo, and there's a muse of epic poetry, and there's a muse of, of lyric poetry, and, and so on, and, and, and different arts. So it, the belief is that the, uh, the poet is in some sense doing something that's divine, and they're worthy of listening to, and important to listen to then. He's not just expressing his feelings. He may have feelings, but that's not what's being said here. There's a greater claim when one invokes a muse. Um, 
but I'll come to the subject matter here first away, away, and then I'll talk about some of the conventions. Even in the first 26 lines, we see a whole host of previous epic conventions being uh, utilized by Mr. Milton. So let me read it, and I won't interrupt myself. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Zion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, Instruct me, for thou knowest thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine. What is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. So that is the invocation and in the introduction to the poem. But first he called, before he's going to recount his narrative, he first calls upon uh, the God, in this case, the Holy Spirit. He calls it the Heavenly Muse and later identifies the Heavenly Muse with the Holy Spirit. Calls upon the Holy Spirit to allow him to tell a tale that is above the Aeonian Mount. Now, the Aeonian Mount is a reference to the Greek mountain where the muses were sought to live, to reside. So this is a tale above theirs. It's not, it's not a, a tale that is, uh, in, in some ways, it's comparing itself to the pagan uh, works. And in other ways, he's saying it's far superior to it. But how do you know that it's superior but by comparison? And this is one of the principles of, of art that will hold all the way up until the Romantic period. We'll find in uh, a month and a half or so when we hit the Romantics that they come up with a new idea of artistic excellence, namely that of originality. But in Milton's day and in every day before the 19th century, to be original was to be wrong and to be an error everything, there's nothing new under the sun. The truth has always been known. All truth is God's truth, and the truth has always been known. We don't need to invent or discover new truth. We don't need to invent or discover new ideas. Modern technology, I mean, I'm recording this on a technical device, that's new in a sense, but the, uh, the, but the concepts and ideas were, were already latent there. They needed to be discovered, but they're not actually original. It's discovering the laws of nature and, and utilizing different ways of, of applying them. In that sense, it's new, but new almost there is a misnomer. Um, but uh, come the 19th century, this idea of novelty related to literature uh, and the arts becomes very, uh, I want to say, it, I don't want to say it becomes dominant, it, it gets rid of the idea of imitating as being a good thing. You ought to learn from those who were excellent before you. Follow their path. Uh, and Milton is doing that. He is following in the paths uh, trodden by Homer and by Virgil by writing an epic. And at the same time, he is saying that his epic is far superior to theirs. Why is it so? Is it because he's so great? Um, well, I don't think he lacked in self-confidence, but I don't think that that's the reason. The reason he thinks it's greater is because his God is greater. And the scope of what he's about to tell is greater. Because if you look to the very first line, 
the, the, the first line of the Iliad by Homer is wrath, the wrath of Achilles. In the Odyssey, which we looked at last semester, Odysseus was renowned for his wisdom. Many minded uh, Odysseus, cunning in his ways. The man of sorrows, though, he, he suffered greatly coming home. Uh, but they were about two men, and, and in both cases, both Greek men were, were, they were princes or kings, but of a very small area of land. Come the Roman epic under Virgil, his story is much greater because he's not talking about the greatness of just a man. He's talking about the greatness of a man, uh, Aeneas, who will lay the foundation for the Roman Empire, which is a worldwide empire. So it's not just uh, he's not just a great man, he's a great man that led to a great nation that encompasses the whole earth. So in that sense, he's greater and his story is greater and he's comparing it. Uh, Virgil says, uh, of arms and of a man I sing. So of arms, a reference to the Iliad, of a man, a reference to the Odyssey, his, he's going to sing of both of those things. And we saw when we looked at the Aeneid that he began with the uh, travels of Odysseus to, to found uh, the new uh, Troy, namely Rome. And he had to suffer along the way. It took him a long time to get there. It was just like Odysseus. And then once he got there, he then had to fight and he fought wars to establish uh, the, uh, the, the, the city that would be the eternal city. And in that sense, he was like Achilles. So of those two heroes, I'm going to tell it in one story. And Homer took 24 books to tell the Iliad and 24 books to tell the Odyssey. I'm going to tell it all in 12 books. And it's that much greater. So there's always that comparative element. So when he begins here uh, and says, of man's disobedience, why is this superior? Because now he's not talking about ro uh, the Roman and the Roman Empire. He's talking about all of mankind. Because in Milton's day, he knows of, uh, of races outside. Uh, the European realm and the Indo-European realm. The, the, the Americas have been discovered. Africa obviously always was, but now the Americas have also been discovered. And yet Milton claims that his story is, it applies to every human being, absolutely everyone. And therefore the fall of mankind is the fall not just of a man, but of all mankind. So. It, it, do, it has a, a much broader scope and significance. It encompasses all of history. So in that sense, it's greater. But so is the story of the greater man. So go to, point, to uh, line four here. Of man's first disobedience, I'll repeat, and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. He's saying you have two men. The man's disobedience is Adam. The greater man who restores us is Christ. This is a story about Christ. So it is about paradise lost, but it's not just telling of the fall of mankind. We're, we'll see that as we uh, move on in the epic. Book nine is the, is the uh, account of the fall. Books 10, 11, and 12 uh, are of God's judgment on fallen mankind and his promise of a deliverer, a redeemer, who Adam places his trust in. And then the whole of salvation history is laid out before him. So in that sense, the greater man who will restore us. We meet him in book three, by the way, but he's not yet incarnate. So the, we meet the Son of God, not yet taken on human flesh. We will meet him. So the, it's a story of man in the big, generic, inclusive sense, but man uh, and the God-man also. So in that sense, far greater than pagan epics. And he says, sing heavenly muse. Now the heavenly muse that on the secret top of Orb or of Sinai did inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. Who's that shepherd? Moses. First five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, books of Moses. He taught them. What did he te teach the chosen seed? In the beginning, how the heavens and the earth 
rose out of chaos. That's how they found out. Moses told them what happened before he was born. It was delivered to him by revelation, by God. This is how, and, he, and Milton's appealing to that same spirit that inspired Moses to write down the account of the generations that came before him as a, an accurate historical account and quite brilliantly narrated uh, and often poetic language. Extraordinary. And he says, so if it's them, or if Zion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, another, again, places where the Holy Spirit has been evident in, in the account of the Bible, but all of them are referring to the inspiration of God. He call, he's calling on God's help. But now it's the God of the Bible, not the muses. He's still calling it the muse. Right? <clears throat> and that's to, again, to compare his story to the pagan epics. And he says, if it prefers you that I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, which is to sto tell the story of God. Now, others had actually attempted this, by the way. Milton's not the first one to tell the account of the fall. So in what sense is it unattempted? Maybe he is dismissing them as not being sufficiently uh, up to his standard. I think he's comparing himself to the Greeks and the Romans and, and, and the pagans, and he's not. He's, he's ignoring Dante, and he's read Dante. He's ignoring it. He doesn't get into that, which is interesting in and of itself to me. The great Milton, who read Italian and went to Italy and met the poets of the day, and they regarded him as a great poet already. And nonetheless, Dante, the great Dante of the Divine Comedy, does not really get much attention in Paradise Lost. How come? It's, an, it's a glaring omission. How come? I don't know the answer exactly, other than that Milton uh, disputes his account but doesn't want to get into that. You know, it's a Catholic uh, epic, right? Um, but he avoids it. I just simply note that. And he says, But chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples, the upright heart and pure, instruct me. So he calls upon us something all else that he'll need here. And that is uh, an ability to overcome his own sinful human nature. This is why it will be greater. No author before him had that capacity. They were all marked not only by the limitations of their time and their age and their perspective, but by human sin, and he's aware of it. And he can't tell it. He admits it. He, it's, a, it's a prayer. It's an invocation. I can't tell this story, but you can. So his claim, this is a big claim, is that this is effectively uh, like scripture in some respects. I don't think he holds it to the same standard, but he is saying the account is based on that, and in some ways, this is uh, his work ha has that sort of status, and it is an, it's an extraordinary. And he says that you, the Spirit, was there from the very beginning, and from the first, line 19, was present and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, sat brooding on the vast abyss and maids to pregnant. That's Genesis one, uh, one and two, where the Spirit of God is presented as hovering over the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? You were there from the beginning. What in me is dark, illumine. What is low, raise and support in order to assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to man. Okay, so he begins, as I say, with a epic convention. What is that? Invocation of the muse. In the Greek and Latin tradition, the muse is always invoked. Mil Milton falls in that, uh, in that, uh, in those footsteps. See if I can turn this. Not sure I can or not. Might not be on there. Um, so he he seeks to do that at any rate. He seeks to follow the the model that's been laid down for him by invoking the muse. 
What else does he do? Well, I, I, sa I said in the uh, intro there, the argument, he says that he'll begin in the middle of things. And that uh, the Latin word for that is he begins in medias res. The word res is the Latin word for thing, and in medias means in the middle, in the middle of things. So what does that mean? Uh, this was a uh, suggestion made by, where is it, the classical tradition. Um, in this case, Horace says that an epic poem ought to begin in the middle of things. And what it means is he begins in the, m in the middle of the story and then he will backtrack and tell how things got to that point. And only then, after he has given the story of how they got to the present, then he will go on forward. So how is that going to work here? Well, he's about to begin by looking at Satan in hell, where he lies, rolling in the lake of fire, along with the rebel angels that fell from heaven. And he will begin there with Satan there. But that's not the real beginning. The real beginning, he's going to tell in, a, in passages that we're not going to read in this class. They'll be uh, in, in uh, books five, six, seven. And that's the war, there's a war in heaven. And if you want to find the story for that, you need to look to Re Revelation 12, where there's a, a battle between the dragon and the uh, angels of God, a war in heaven and angel and, and Satan and one third of the angels are struck down and are sent down to hell. From thence they come up and then seek to tempt and succeed in their, their uh, attempt to bring about the downfall of mankind. Now the Bible begins in medias race effectively. It doesn't tell that backstory. Like how did, who's Satan? How did he get there? Why is he so upset? What's going on there? Like, what, what, who is this figure, this mysterious figure in serpentine guise? What, what, what's going on here? Because it's not just a snake. It's called Satan. It's an adversary. There's something more than that. Well, the backstory you actually have to go to the end of the Bible in Revelation 12, but there are other references in, in Scripture before that. But there, we're given a sort of a, a large, big picture uh, view of what is happening in all of human history. So if you want to read the whole account of the Bible, look at Revelation 12. It's all there in the biggest picture imaginable. And Milton's going back there, so, but he will backtrack though. So books one and two will begin in hell. Book three, he'll jump up to heaven. Book four, he'll go down to the earth and look at mankind. <coughs> we'll see Adam and Eve created already. We'll look at them. Books five and six are the war in heaven. How, how Satan ended up where he was when we first met him in book one. Book seven and eight, the angels are sent to warn Adam and Eve that there are, they have an enemy on earth that wants to undo them. So they're warned. Book nine, the encounter between Satan and Adam and Eve and the, the, the fall of mankind. And then only then, nine uh, in 10, 11, and 12, then we get the uh, historical narrative from that time to our time. So that's the, but that's the in medias race. So it's, back, it's jumping all over the place. And I'm just telling you that because it, he, you might be puzzled by that, but he's following the conventions in this sense. Because if you looked at the Iliad, the Iliad begins with uh, Achilles sitting outside the Trojan wall, refusing to fight. He won't fight. And if he won't fight, the Greeks can't win. And they've been fighting for over nine years. And he is now sitting down and he's pouting. He's refusing to fight because Agamemnon's taken away his prize girl. And he's just pouting. And his wrath is kindled. And he won't fight. And then we get the backstory of how the Trojans ended up, or the, uh, the Greeks got there. And then we only then, <coughs> halfway through the whole story, <coughs> I think around book 17, he decides he's going to fight Achilles. <coughs> only then. But the backstory of how we got to all that point, that gets played out before, and only then does the story carry on. Okay, Achilles is no longer pouting. His cousin Patroclus has been killed. 
Hector thought the guy was Achilles because he was wearing his armor, and now Achilles is going to avenge himself on him, not only because he killed his cousin but, and his friend, but because he dared think that he could beat Achilles. How dare he even think that he could beat him? That's how proud he is. Like, you, you actually thought you beat Achilles? How dare you? And then, so it's, a, it's all about wrath and, and, and anyway. But the, the in medias race, it begins that way and it does that repeatedly in the epic. So he's following in the, that, the, those conventions here. Now, what else does we, have we got here? Well, the invocation of the muse, I talked about this. Um, we will get a, a, a descent to the underworld. In this case, we go to it right away in book one. In the uh, Odyssey, I believe it was in book nine, in the, uh, I might be wrong about that, it might be 10, thereabouts. In the uh, Aeneid, it's in uh, book four and six, six in particular, uh, where Aeneas goes down into the underworld to find out how he's to get home. That's the turning point for him. So the hero goes down to the underworld and then arises back up. And none but a hero who is a mortal can rise from the realm of the dead. So it's a heroic act. Not any, just anyone can do it. Mortals, when you go down to the realm of the dead, you're, it's because you're dead. <laughs> you're not coming back. So it's a heroic thing. Here he does go to the underworld, but he, d he doesn't allow his hero to go down there. He begins there. Although some have said, because he goes down to the underworld and he spends so much time and gives Satan so much air time. It's Satan who's Milton's hero. I think this is a misreading of the text. Theologically, it's impossible. And it's impossible that Milton should really think that Satan is truly heroic. Nonetheless, there is a descent to the underworld. I'll just leave it at that. In book three, we go and we look at, at at heaven, and we see a counts, another epic convention, the Council of the Gods. <clears throat> or in this case, the Council of God, because God the Father is going to have a discussion with God the Son. Now that is, we, that's in all the epics as well. The gods are involved in the world of men, they see what's going on, and they want to intervene. They have favorites. They're interested in human affairs. Here it comes out in this way. Now, it, there are also differences, obviously, but still the convention has been followed. We also have, and this is, is here right in the beginning, we have a hero. There's an epic hero. Now, a hero is a role model. Literally, a hero is a, is a Homeric word and it refers to probably a demigod, somebody who's half god, half human. In uh, Achilles' case, uh, he had divine parentage on one side. Same with Odysseus and same with Aeneas for that matter. So they all had a goddess mother, an earthly father. <coughs> and that made them <coughs> Supermen, almost, except they're mortal. But they're greater, they're capable of greater things. They're closer to the gods. And the gods look upon them favorably because they also act in a godlike manner, as in a virtuous manner. And so they're role models for those who read them and are listening and learning from them. And what they're learning is not just small things, it's, it's comprehensive, it's encyclopedic. So this also is a feature of the epic. It is cons it's encyclopedic. It covers everything that you would need to be a good human being and live a worthy life. It's all there. It's not telling you everything that could be known about absolutely everything, but it's telling you from the big picture how to behave in certain contexts, how you should orient your life. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose? What does a good life look like? It's there in the epic. 
how does the hero respond to danger and frustration and suffering? <coughs> how does he speak to those who are weaker than he is? How does he treat his opponents? How does he treat danger? Is he totally self-absorbed or is he, does he think of, <coughs> of, uh, of others? So Aeneas, for instance, his, is heroic because he denies himself. He does it for the glory of Rome. He does it for his son. He does it for people that he will never meet. Right? So this is, this is heroic to a, a, a Roman for whom, duty, for whom duty is everything. Right? It's not about me. It's about what needs to be done for the glory of Rome and for the sake of everyone. I don't matter. It's about the group. So it is in that sense. The other aspects of it are, are I, I don't want to say they're less important. There is something called epic diction. And by diction, I mean the language. <coughs> so we noted, and I asked you how you found it to read it, and you found it, you know, it's difficult. Yes, it, and it's self-consciously not written in regular English prose or verse. It's a little challenging. And he probably could have made it easier, but he didn't want to. It, there's a certain elevated diction intended by Milton here. And he wants to, you to come up to his level a little bit here. And you can do it. It takes time. As I say, if you read it, and particularly if you read it out loud, you'll find that your ear starts to attune to it a bit. And you find it a little easier. And the fact that he, he, his uh, syntax is sometimes flipped around, you, you just get used to it. And then you start to like it, I think. <coughs> Another feature of the epic diction are epic similes. So long extended comparisons that add richness and depth and so forth to the whole narrative. That's a part of epic diction. It's not the whole of it. So epic similes are one feature, but so is the, the, the general uh, verse form. So those seven immediately come to mind. And I'll add an eighth. <coughs> it seeks to outdo the foregoing epics. Yes, yeah, they are, yes. And originally, probably the first ones, like in, in, um, in ancient Greece, uh, they would, that would be the context. The, and there was a singer, and they weren't only, it's only read aloud, they were sung then. And sung, so they're, they're, he's singing the tales uh, that they already know. This is the, the interesting thing about it. They, they're not telling a new story when they're talking about the fall of Troy. and. Um, and the uh, victory of Achilles over Hector. And he's not even telling the whole of the story because they don't even t they, he doesn't even tell what we even know that Achilles had a heel, right? We have Achilles heels, right? That's how he died. He got shot with an arrow in the heel. That's not in the Iliad. How is that possible? Well, it's told in other stories, but not that story. So there's a lot of stuff about the Trojan War that isn't even told in the most important work on the Trojan War. But what is told is the most important things. We don't even, we're not even told about the, the uh, fall of Troy. I mean, we know what's going to happen. Like once, once Hector is defeated, it's over. Like we know that Troy is going to fall. Homer doesn't bother with it then. He allows, them, he allows uh, Hector's father nine days to mourn his son. But guess what happens after day nine? It's back on, and then it's all going to burn, but it, it ends there. Very interesting. Um, and, and so it's sung aloud, and there's, there's great uh, emphasis on what is told and also what's not told. And everyone knows the story, and do they like it any less for it? No, they love it. And that's because of the way it's told and, what, and the characters in it. And they, they're lifelike, and they're great characters. It's not just Achilles. There are other great figures. And the speeches are fantastic. I mean, in the Iliad, there's a lot of fighting. But there's at least as much verbal jousting. Like, there are great speeches going left and right, both models of rhetoric. And the ancient world, the Greeks are known for rhetoric. I think their models for it are actually in Homer's Iliad. And a recent uh, author has, ma has made that case very strongly, actually, that what becomes the famous attribute of, of 
Athens, namely its eloquence, its use of rhetoric, they got that from Homer, who probably lived, well, the Battle of Troy is probably 1200 BC. The uh, Homer is probably living about 800 BC, so he's talking about ancient history, 400 years before him. And then the uh, events at Athens, well, that's f about 400 BC, so another 400, so 800 years have passed between uh, the Trojan War and them, and they're still uh, listening to Homer and regarding him as their nation's teacher. So it's like the Bible for them. So think about 800 years. What happened 800 years ago for us? 1200. Well, we were in the middle of what uh, the Enlightenment calls the Dark Ages. It was actually a terrific phase of culture. Uh, around 1200, there was a sort of a, a renaissance um, in Europe. Uh, of the intellect, modern or the medieval universities were just popping up around that time. So it was a terrific age of culture. But that it's that's middle age. Well, that's how long before when Plato and Aristotle are on the scenes. Uh, so it's the uh, say so number eight is exactly it seeks to outdo its predecessor. So there's in a sense that each successive poet compares himself to the previous poets, and at this and by doing so gives them honor and deference and says, this is great, and it's so great that I'm going to follow your example. And at the same time says, my poem is greater. And not because of me, but because of what I am telling. Right? This is the story that will comprehend all stories. Because it's about the God who made the heavens and the earth. No such claim was ever made about the Greek or Roman heroes. They don't get into that. Whereas here it does. So it's a, it's a big claim. Furthermore, the epic heroism <coughs> in Milton's epic is going to be a vastly different character than that of Homer or Virgil. I, think, I mean, Achilles was, you don't want to meet Achilles. First of all, because he was such a great man, you'd probably be tempted to worship him. Secondly, because you wouldn't want to cross him, <laughs> because he was fierce and proud and warlike. You don't, and, and pity is something that the Greeks don't show for their enemies. There's no pity. There's no mercy. Greeks don't show mercy. That's, that's a Christian trait. Same with the Romans. The Romans don't show pity. What do, you, what do your enemies deserve? That's what they're going to get, and then some. And then we'll show them, we'll, put their, we'll, we'll hang them on crosses to demonstrate the glory of Rome and to prevent them from ever thinking they can defy us ever again. We're going to crucify them. That's what the Gre Greco-Roman world will do. And the ancient Near East, same things. Brutal. No mercy. That would be unjust. You deserve to what you're getting. Uh, in Milton's rendering, uh, God though he has an infinitely just cause to be outraged at man's first disobedience will show grace. And his model of heroism will be that of humility, mercy to his enemies, forgiveness. So it's a total inversion. So it's not just, it's not just that, so here's the, the bones of the epic, as it were, being placed there. But what, what falls within the bones is totally different, not just in the greatness of its extent, but in the, the way in which he, he regards epic greatness. Now, he, I'll, I'll dig down on that further when we come to the invocation. So the invocation of the muse happens here in, in book one, but it, it happens four times, in fact. It happens in one, three, seven, and nine. And I will not I'll overlook seven, but I'll look at three and nine. He invokes it four times. At the beginning, you always do it at the beginning. Book three, he does it because he was in hell before, and now he's about to describe heaven, and he, he needs another invocation. So he's just been describing hellish things, and he uh, needs purification, basically. So now I'm going to describe the God who is beyond all description. I better pray again, he, and he does. Uh, in nine, he's about to change, and change the discourse to what he's about, the whole purpose of the epic. He's now going to tell about the fall. The fall. And he's going to change it to more of a tragic story. It's a tragedy within the epic. 
Anyway, so that's how he begins it. And it let, me, let me come to some of the great speeches of uh, Satan here. And the description of hell, which is extraordinary. So, sorry, that was a big intro, but I think necessary and helpful. So here's Milton. Say first, now note that he's saying, and who's he speaking to? It's still the muse. So say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, thy being the Holy Spirit, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first, what cause moved our grandparents in that happy state, favored of heaven so highly to fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint, lords of the world besides. Who first seduced them to that foul revolt? The infernal serpent. He it was whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge de deceived uh, the mother of mankind. What time his pride had cast him out from heaven with all his host, uh, with all his host of rebel angels by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the most high if he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. So there's already uh, almost irony in this. How can you be equal to the most high? Think about that. It's, it's an impossibility. If something's most high, there's no comparison even. We're not talking about uh, good and two things that are equally good, or even comparatively good. It's the most high, it's the superlative. He's above all things. Well, you can't equal that, or you get rid of the superlative. It's an impossibility. And after all, God created him as well. How is, he, how is it possible for the creature, in this case Satan, to be equal to his creator? And yet he sought the vain attempt, and M Milton calls it a vain attempt, and thought that he could raise war against him and win. The, the sheer vanity of the idea is ridiculous. And yet, this is what happened. And him, the almighty power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded, though immortal. But his doom reserved him to more wrath. For now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels can, that is, as far as they see, he views the dismal situation waste and wild. A dungeon, horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges in a fiery deluge fed with ever burning sulfur unconsumed. Such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness and their portion set as far from, removed from God in the light of heaven as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell. Now, the sentences are long. I read them <coughs> more or less the way they ought to be read. If there's no punctuation at the end of the line, you read to the next line. So there is a sort of a, a, a punctuation insofar as there's a, an end of the line. That is a sort of a punctuation, actually. But you're not supposed to pause. You go on reading the next line. And when you do it, sometimes you'll find that there is a punctuation mark uh, after the first word or two. And then you're supposed to pause. And what he's done at that point is he, he has moved the end of the line onto the next line. Uh, so there's a variation in the rhythm and the meter of it. But the lines, note that he goes on for extended, uh, because such is the greatness of the description. 
Uh, if you think the Bible doesn't write this way, that's because the punctuation of our English editors have made it appear not so. So in John's Gospel, right at the beginning, it goes on from the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on for 20 lines as well. There is no punctuation. It just keeps going. The editors, to simplify, have added punctuation into the text. But it's an unbroken vision. You don't want to punctuate it with pauses. You want to be overwhelmed by the, the whole flow of it. And that's what Milton's doing here. But note the description here. And I think there's some really interesting things uh, that uh, I, I want to bring to your attention here. So first of all, um, as I said, it talks about the almighty power hurling him from the eternal ethereal sky. It says that in verse 45. If we go to book six, it actually describes a war in heaven. It's not much of a war. And God doesn't hurl him down. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there. What really happens is the angels, the angel army of God, uh, faces the angel army of Satan for three days. The three days that are like Good Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday. So it's a three-day battle. And, this, and God is, doesn't even appear. He's not a part of the fight. It's the angels, little squabbling. At the end of day three, the Messiah, the Son, just appears. That's all he does. He appears. And the angels, the rebel angels, back, 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 but the back to, and they fall terrified at the mere appearance of the Son of God. And, that, and they fall down in terror. Right? It's, a, it's a different telling here. Um, and in one sense, it's talking about the, this way and things that we see as contradictory, the actions and volitions of the characters and God's ordaining of things. So they have free will. They do this thing, but actually God sends them down. Right? Those are both being asserted in, in different ways at different points here. But when they fall, and they fall to the bottom of hell, he notices that it's even worse because now he not only is in hell, which is bad enough, he remembers what it was like not to be in hell. So things just keep getting worse and worse, and they will continue to get worse there, actually. So da Dante uh, portrays hell as a fixed place where people are stuck in certain layers. And it never gets any worse. You're, you're in the frozen in ice and eternally tormented according to the sin that beset you, afflicted you. you. You will be eternally afflicted there. In hell, it keeps getting worse. Just as in heaven, it keeps getting more and more glorious. Change from glory into glory. There's a terrific sense of it's always uh, changing and getting better. It's eternally good. The, the angels are crying, glory, 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 and it, yet there's no monotony, and that's because it, it, it's growing. It's delighting. Uh, when it's described, however, it's a furnace, and it's a dungeon, and it's flamed, and no, but from those flames, there's no light, but rather darkness visible. Now you tell me what darkness visible is. Because I don't know. There's no such thing. You can't see darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Light's the thing by which you see things. So for Milton to describe hell, a place where there's no light, because light, remember, represents God. God isn't light in the sense that everything that's light is not God. So I see light outside. That doesn't mean it's God. And yet, so light is not God, but God is light. Right? So it's a, it's a symbolic representation. And so in hell, where God, he is as far away from God as he can possibly be, there's no light. God's presence has been removed from his. And so he is in torment because to be in the presence of God is to be in eternal bliss. So he's in eternal torment simply by being deprived of God's presence. And so he can't see anything. And yet part of his torment is to see the difference there. So he's using language that is, quite frankly, paradoxical. The absence of God is the absence of good. The absence of light is the absence of God. So it's, a, it's negation. It's the Augustinian view of evil. Evil is actually sort of nothing. If God is being, this is the absence of being. 
the source of the so in that sense so he's, it's a very theological portrait of the underworld here it's quite complex sophisticated and yet very powerful you can just visualize and yet it doesn't make sense we mean darkness visible anyway he says that how unlike the place from whence he f they fell and there I'll read on the companions of his fall overwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire he soon discerns and weltering by his side one next himself in power and next in crime long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven called Satan with bold words breaking the horrid silence thus began now, this is Satan speaking to Beelzebub if thou beest he but oh how fallen how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness didst thou shine myriads though bright if he whom mutual league united thoughts and counsels equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise join with me once now misery hath joined in equal ruin into what pit thou seest from what height fallen so much the stronger proved he with his thunder and till then who knew the force of those dire arms yet not for those nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict do i repent or change though changed in outward luster that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit that with the mightiest raised me to contend and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne all of this is bs by the way remember that satan is the father of lies so you have to think about character the characters speak in accordance with their character god always tells the truth satan always lies he manipulates the truth there are various forms of lies there's the outright lie and then there's the misrepresentation the lack of contextualization various forms so he's just deviating a little bit but he does not tell the truth so when he says he shook god's throne that's not true he says it was a dubious battle as if the outcome were unsure well how do you do against the Almighty? I mean, think about that. You can you know, win a battle against the Almighty. Does that make any sense? Like in what possible world could you win a fight against the Almighty? It's not possible. And yet he keeps asserting these things which are flat, flatly mendacious claims, just lying. But he does it all the time. Uh, and, and he's confused and you can see the, the use of the, the brackets here. The, is a reflection of that he keeps having to include information to reflect the confusion of his mind and that it reflects the confusion of his state remember he's he's rolling around in the lake of fire now he's not in control of himself this is the one thing he was in control of himself before and now he is still uh, he thinks he's and, and in a sense he's far away from God but he's still God's drudge he actually does God's bidding he's God's slave he thinks he's defying him and so there's this great speech here that I will not change I will not repent or change because I have a fixed mind and he's going to add to that here now what does he say so here's the great speech that some think make uh, Satan Milton's hero because the speech is so uh, grandiose he says what though the field be lost all is not lost the unconquerable will and study of revenge immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield and what in else not to over to be overcome that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire that were low indeed that were an ignominy ignominy and shame beneath this downfall since by fate the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail since through experience of this great event in arms not worse in foresight much advanced 
we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war irreconcilable to our grand foe who now triumphs and in the excess of joy soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So he's accusing God of being a tyrant because he's on his own because he kicked out Satan and that makes him a tyrant because he didn't want to share his power. He was a king. Tyranny is not uh, having all the power in ruling. Tyranny is marked by injustice. There's no injustice in God's rule. Satan doesn't like it. That doesn't make it unjust. It's entirely just. He got exactly what he wished for. But he claims that he's in a better state to have a second go at God because now he knows how strong he was because he's been beaten. Oh, I, who knew how strong he was until we got into a fight? Now I know. So we won't try that way again. We'll, we'll try plan B. <coughs> and because we've learned from experience, we're going to do better this time. That's effectively what he's saying. He's lying. And in the lying, he's also deceiving himself. This is the, one of the great harms of lying is that you live in the reality that you're constructing. And some people who lie habitually can't remember what the truth is. They walk away from the truth. They live in an alternate reality. Milton's comment here, which is sort of an editorial comment, so spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. And him thus answered his bold compeer. And I'll skip over Beelzebub's answer, and I'll come back to Satan's response to Beelzebub, because I, I want to make some progress today. Uh, line 157. Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. But of this be sure, to do aught good, that is to do no good, will never be our task. To do any sort of good will never be our task. But ever to do ill, our sole delight, as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to pervert that end, and out of good still define means of evil which oft times may succeed so as perhaps shall grieve him, if I fail not, and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. But see, the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursued back to the gates of heaven. The sulphurous hail shot after us in storm or blown hath laid the fiery surge that from the precipice of heaven receiving us falling and the thunder winged with red lightning and impetuous rage Perhaps hath spent his shafts and ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion. So then he goes, and I'll skip over that, and then he, they decide to, so the two of them move onwards, and they do, and they, they sort of go along the fiery gulf on their bellies like serpents. And he is compared to various uh, ancient uh, creatures to a uh, Titanian, an earthborn, or Typhon, which is a serpent, in uh, the Theogony of uh, Hesiod, an ancient story of, the, how the, of the, the sky gods against the, the earth gods, the Titans against the, imp the Olympian gods. Uh, and Typhon was a serpent, so he's like that serpent. Or he's even, as it describes in the book of Job, like Leviathan or Isaiah. That's what he's compared to. Now, in, if you ever read Isaiah or Leviathan, the commentators often regard that serpent as a referring back to this serpent in Genesis 3. It's just in a different form, more monstrous. And as I say in Revelation 12, he's referred to as the dragon. Same guy. Slightly different representation. Uh, so he's described as the, these monstrous beasts, and he goes on. And now let me pick to this interesting there. So he comes out and he, but th w this little bit is interesting and very troubling, quite frankly. Uh, line 210. 
So they move on, and he said, nor ever thence had risen or, or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs, that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others, and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on man by him seduced. Note that he's giving away the game. You haven't even talked about the seduction of man yet, but Milton's already talking because he knows you know about it. He's not telling a story that hasn't been told. He's retelling it in an epic form, but he, the, he assumes that people have read Genesis. But on himself, that is Satan, treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Forthwith, so note this, God allows Satan to get off the floor of hell. He doesn't have free will. Not solely. He's not an independent agent. He's God's drudge. He serves God. Does that mean that God's responsible for the fall of mankind? Milton's going to address that in book three. It's a serious question. If God is omnipotent, almighty, omniscient, you can see what's going to come, and he knows the end of things from the beginning, before they even happen, how is God not in some way culpable? To say he didn't know is to say he's not God, so he did know. To say he couldn't have prevented it is to say he's not God, so he could have stopped it in some way. So what, what's going, how is Milton going to deal with that? But make d note, note here, he allows this to happen, and the purpose is given right here, it's to make things far much worse for Satan and to demonstrate his grace to those who will receive it. That, and how much more gra gracious then? But we'll, we'll come to that when we come to it. And in this, I think Milton is orthodox in his theology. But he moves onward this, and then he comes to this final grand speech. And I'm going to read this, and then we're going to skip forward. <coughs> and this is line 242. Any comments or questions here before I read this, by the way? I know I'm going over a lot today. But I, I want to read a lot and get you, give you a sense of the grandeur and the, the substance of the, what's going on here. So I'll, I'll, let me read then, hearing no questions. And this is Satan speaking again. Is this the region, this the soil, the climb, said the lo then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, claiming his own sovereignty. Farthest from him is best whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells, Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same in what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here, at least, we shall be free. The Almighty hath not made here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I'll leave it off there. He claims freedom. Here he's free. God's not going to take away this place from him. Here he's the sovereign. These are all lies. He's also not free. He's not sovereign, he's not free, but he claims all of these and he claims it by a specious argument. But it sounds like a good argument, right? There's a, there, it's not that there's no reasoning to it, but it's, it's a bad argument. One, because he's not free. God is, we've, Milton's told us, he's allowed him to lift his head and he couldn't have left it had he decided he wouldn't let him lift his head from it. And secondly, he, we're going to find out in a minute, he's not even the uh, ruler of the underworld. We'll meet the figure that who is in a minute. He's just one of the guys down there. He's just the proudest of the whole lot.
By the way, his name used to be Lucifer. The bearer of light, luce in Latin is light, pharaoh is to bear, to bear light. He was the light bearer, he was a bright, one of the brightest of the archangels. And now he's Satan, he's Shatan, the adversary. That's all he is. But he's not God's equal, so there isn't a good and an evil, and it's like a battle between good and evil. That misrepresents what's going on here. This is a creature who is an evil, wicked, being and God is almighty and it's and good will of necessity by virtue of the fact that God is God and Satan is not will triumph over the evil weaker creature the battle was never in doubt never that's not how Satan tells it of course and Satan will furthermore appear to have a little substance to his argument because what does he do he achieves his ambition which is to pervert mankind so I'll, I'll skip over that a little bit, but I'll, I'll retell it. What they do at this point is they, little ha they have a little council in hell. We're going to see the council in heaven in book three, but here they have a little council in hell, and Satan asks the other demons who have fallen, and there's a whole list of ancient Near East deities here. So we'll meet Moloch, and we'll meet um, Mammon. Mammon, by the way, wants to go back to earth and dig for gold. Unsurprisingly, Mammon, right? He likes wealth and so forth. And Moloch wants to go at him full bell. You know, Moloch's a horrid uh, infant sacrifice to Moloch. It's a, a god, a, an iron god, and babies are sacrificed on his scalding hot iron hands. A horrid god sacrificing babies to him. Moloch is fierce, and Belial is perverted. And you get different, different suggestions about what they should do. The one that is proposed that Satan most likes is Maybe we won't try the full frontal assault again. Let's, that, that, that's, I'm, I'm a deceiver, but I'm not that deceived. That one's not going to, let's try perversion. We'll pervert that creature that we've heard about while we were in heaven, that there would be a creature made in the image of God and placed on earth where we've never been and never seen. Let's go see if we can find earth and pervert that creature, and that will that will really upset God if we do that. So let's go do that. And that's the resolution. Uh, at the end of book one, they build up a, uh, a city, an infernal city. It's pandemonium, literally pandemonium, which is the house of all the devils. Daemonium is the de demons, and pan is all. The house of all the devils, pandemonium is in hell. Pandemonium is a, a, associated with a loud, horrible noise. So they're making a lot of noise. And then the question arises, well, who's going to go up and do this? After they've resolved who's going to pervert mankind, who's going to do this? And now all of them who've been sounding pretty brave think about it a little bit and think, I'm not sure, so sure about that. Satan, of course, wants to do it. And he waits for the rest of them to go quiet and then comes forward and they all cheer him and <coughs> here's our hero. And of course, he's a tyrant. He, he claims immediate rule over all of them. And they are happy with this because they don't care about being ruled over to begin with. So he is actually the tyrant. So I say everything he accuses God of is true of him. He's the true tyrant. He does not allow for freedom. Uh, he loves perversion. And e it's all about power. So he accuses. So the re God, the only difference between Satan and God is power, says Satan. You know, he just has power. But other than that, reason, we're on the same grounds. We're equals. He's just, he's just powerful. You know, Satan, Satan's been triggered here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a power differential. I, you know, I'm going to overcome that and get back up at him. So he resolves to go up, and then he does go up. And, and book two is the description of Satan going up through uh, the realm of chaos. So he goes from hell and up through chaos. And while he's going... He's, he's, he's got, remember, he's got wings. He's going and he's flying around like this because he can't even control himself. He's banging. If there were walls, he'd be banging off the walls because he's just sort of, he's not in control, but he's going up towards the gate of hell and he meets something. So let me skip forward to that in book two. Uh, and I'll begin with his ascent. And note, so there's a constant, begun, they debate whether they should try and get heaven back and the third is to find out about mankind. And then they go up there and they go to hell gates and they find them shut. Let me come there to the gates of hell.
And we'll pick it up at line 629. Meanwhile, the adversary of God and man. So he's not just against God, he is against man in his uh, determination. Meanwhile, the, the uh, 630, sorry, just, it's hard to read here. Oh, there it is. Meanwhile, the adversary of God and man, Satan, with thoughts inflamed of highest design, puts on swift wings and towards the gates of hell explores his solitary fight, flight. Sometimes he scours the right-hand coast, sometimes the left, now shaves with level wing the deep, then soars up the fiery concave towering high. As when far off at sea a flight, descri a fleet descried, hangs in the clouds by equinoctial winds, close sailing from Bengala, or the isles of Ternate and Tidore, where merchants bring their spicy drugs. They on the trading flood through the wide Ethiopian to the Cape, ply stemming nightly towards the pole, so seemed far off the flying fiend. So Satan is, is compared to a fleet of drug traders. And if you ever see, uh, on, if you're on the sea, it's a bit of an optical illusion. It looks like, and, and there are clouds, and there's a, a ship in the distance that sometimes looks like the ship is up on the clouds. So he, oh, that's Milton's description here. And that's Satan, they're not flattering descriptions. He's a drug trader. And then when he does at last appear, hell bounds, high reaching to the horrid roof, and thrice threefold the gates. Three folds were brass, three iron, three of adamantine rock, impenetrable, impaled with circling fire, yet unconsumed. Before the gates there sat on either side a formidable shape. The one seemed woman to the waist and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold, voluminous and vast. A serpent armed with mortal sting. About her middle, round a cry of hellhounds, never ceasing, barked with wide Siberian mouths, full loud and rung a hideous peal. Yet when they list, as in they heard anything, they would creep, if aught disturbed their noise, into her womb and kennel there. Yet there still barked and howled, within unseen, far less abhorred than these vexed Scylla, bathing in the sea that parts Calabria from the sh horse Trinacrian shore, nor uglier follow the night hag when, called in secret, riding through the air, she comes lured with the smell of infant blood to dance with Lapland witches, while the laboring moon eclipses at their charms. The other shape, line six, six, six. The other shape, if shape it might be called, that shape had none, distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called, that shadow seemed, for each seemed either, black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed his head the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Satan was now at hand, and from his seat the monster, moving onward, came as fast with horrid strides. Hell trembled as he strode. The undaunted fiend, what this might be, admired. Admired, not feared. God and his son except. Created thing not valued he, nor shunned. And with disdainful look thus first began. And I'm going to, well, I'll, ca I'll carry on and I'll come back. <coughs> Satan to this horrid shape that has no shape. Whence and what art thou, execrable shape, that darest through grim and terrible advance thy miscreated front athwart my way to yonder gates? <coughs> He's getting in his way. Through them I mean to pass, that be assured. Without leave asked of thee, retire or taste thy folly, and learn by proof, hell-born, not to contend with spirits of heaven. So now Satan claims himself, you know, the monarch of hell. He, he's upgrading his qualifications a bit. He's a spirit of heaven. You're hell-born. I'm putting you in your place. To whom the goblin full of wrath replied, 
Art thou that traitor angel? Art thou he who first broke peace in heaven and faith, till then unbroken, and in proud rebellious arms drew after him the third part of heaven's sons, conjured against the highest, for which both thou and they, outcast from God, are here condemned to waste eternal days in woe and pain? And reckons thou thyself with spirits of heaven, hell doomed, and breathes defiance here and scorn, where I reign king, and to enrage thee more, thy king and lord, back to thy punishment, false fugitive, and to thy speed add wings, lest with a whip of scorpions I pursue the, thy lingering, or with one stroke of this dart, strange horror seize thee and pangs unfelt before. I'll pick it up there next time. The encounter between this shape and Satan at the gates of hell. I'll pick it up there and then please read on to book three as well, okay?